Üdvözöllek titeket az Oroszországnak szeretettel, vagy az LMBTQ jogok a világban című eseményünkön, ami a Budapest Pride esemény sorozatának a része. A Momentumban úgy gondoltuk, hogy az elmúlt másfél év különösen keményen homofób és transfób törvénykezése során szükséges egy nemzetközi párbeszéd elindítása, és ennek is a része ez a mai beszélgetés. Kérlek, élvezzétek is. Mi egyebek? Hajrá! Hello everybody, uh, my name is Remy Boni, uh, I'm the executive director of Forbidden Colors. Uh, I'm going to be the host uh, of tonight. Today's event is called From Russia with Love and we are here together in Budapest uh, and Hungary in, on a very particular moment. Hungary has been dominating the world news for over for the last three or four weeks with the law on Hungarian anti-LGBTQ law um, which has uh, shocked many of us uh, and the law is an anti-propaganda law which reminds us of a law uh, which was passed in 2013 in, in, in Russia um, and yeah we are going to discuss the law we are going to discuss the, the broader situation of LGBTQ um, rights all over Europe um, and I'm I'm going to start with introducing the, the panelists that we will have today. I will, we, I will start with the one that is joining us from the United States. Uh, hello, welcome uh, Anastasia. Anasta Hello, hey. Anastasia Karimova is a Russian uh, civic activist, blogger and former journalist. Uh, since 2019 she is uh, the program director of the Foundation for Democratic uh, Development uh, and uh, she is basically aiming uh, for, hum for more human rights and gender equality in Russia. Um, next uh, here today and presence uh, we have uh, to start with Anna. Uh, Anna Donat is a member of the European Parliament from, from Hungary. From from the, from the political part in Momentum, which is also hosting the event today. Um, and uh, yeah, you are basically in Parliament since 2019 uh, and have been one of a very vocal, very vocal also on LGBTIQ issues, not just in Hungary, but uh, across across Europe. Um, then we have uh, Bart. Bart is a Polish, a Polish LGBTIQ activist, very well known in Poland, especially since 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 last year, where where uh, Bart was 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 basically going to almost every uh, campaign trial, uh, uh, campaign uh, event of, 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 of Andrzej Duda, the, the current president, uh, conservative president of, 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 of Poland, uh, very, um, asking for more attention to LGBTIQ rights. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, all the way from the Netherlands, uh, Lisa, Lisa van Henneken, as member of parliament for, for D66, uh, the, 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 the progressive liberal party and, and, and the Netherlands uh, also Welcome, uh, Lisa. Um, let me maybe start with, with Bart, because Bart did something very particular today. <laughs> he almost got arrested, right? Um, what did you do, actually? Yes, actually, I want to share with you the thing that I have done today. So I put the sign uh, in front of the Hungarian parliament, and I put it, I hang it actually to the uh, door of the Hungarian parliament, and it means there is a very simple uh, message on it. I mean, the LGBT free zone. Uh, actually, the whole country, since the new law which has been introduced, became a hostile place for the LGBT people. So I can also imagine that this debate, after some few days, after the uh, vacatio legis of the new law, uh, maybe could be banned or we can pay some kind, of, some kind of consequences of it. So I use my privilege as a gay male who is an uh, activist and uh, I just put it over there. Uh, so it was my kind of protest and solidarity to show it that we now can protest, we can now show our support and solidarity with the Hungarian people. As a pool, I know that uh, uh, we go a very similar path uh, and what is g happening now in Hungary come in very next month for years be copy pasted to the Poland and therefore I think that this Polish-Hungarian Brotherhood Alliance, what we used to say so much uh, about, uh, can be also seen as a queer solidarity, queer movement, queer uh, hope and therefore I want to share this is idea of solidarity between queers. Yes, I mean the, the word has fallen the anti-propaganda law, um, and maybe before zooming in the situation to the situation that we have seen over the last weeks developing here in Hungary, we should maybe 
as I was saying in the beginning, the, the, the law really resembles a law from Russia and also an anti-propaganda law. And maybe we should just ask uh, Anastasia, um, this anti-propaganda law which was, which was uh, introduced in 2013 in Russia, what does it actually mean in practice for the Russians, for the Russian LGBTQ people? Uh, well, you know, uh, it's a tricky question because um, I think the uh, worst out outcome of this uh, legislation is that it created the culture where um, it become possible to be more intolerant, basically. So. It's not that um, the authorities use that law all that often, but it basically justify uh, discrimination at the workplace, even if, um, for example, a director of a school, uh, mid let's say middle school, uh, they um, learn from rumors or from social media that one of the teachers is queer uh, and they would do everything to fire that person uh, and uh, they don't even need to make a case like a criminal or any um, uh, legal case against this person they would just try to push uh, this person uh, out of this uh, institution um, and then the person will learn from other employees that it happened because they were queer so I think uh, it's not the legislation itself is, uh, I mean, it is terrible, but um, the environment that it created, uh, basically uh, it made the intolerance and discrimination more legitimate and more socially acceptable. That is, that is the worst outcome, I would say. Yeah, it's, 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 it's something very worrying, of course, because especially here in Europe where we always pledge for European values and so on, and we uh, have this idea that democracy and human rights is established in Europe. But now we have a country in Central Europe who is basically introducing a law that goes against all of this. Um, so, yeah, and I'm coming, I'm coming to you, of course, as a Hungarian. How do you feel about this? Is this as a Hungarian living in the, in the center of Europe, uh, having such an attack on your democracy, on your human rights. How do you feel about that personally? Well, first of all, welcome everybody. I'm, I'm really glad that a lot of people are here and also many more watching us online. And I'm really appreciate that all of you came to my hometown Budapest. I feel uh, um, uh, really grateful to be among you. I mean, um, I, I'm trying my best, but I always feel that as very much braver people, if I'm just looking around to me. I mean, what, your work is really, really uh, something that, uh, that gives us power and motivation. And also it shows that it's, uh, it's not just uh, Identity politics is not just uh, um, an issue of a small group, it's a common issue. So when such a law is introduced, I feel shamed. I feel ashamed uh, because it's shameful politically and as a um, um, human perspective, um, it's is shameful. Um, I believe that there is no democracy without uh, the respect and protection of uh, human rights. But you can't cherry picking. And our government is keep cherry picking about rights and about which group of people deserves any rights. Uh, they always highlighting uh, different minorities, like Hungarians living in abroad, which are really important. But sometimes they feel like their ethnic or sexual minorities are not a part of minority protection. Um, this is why I, I believe that all these moves, I mean, it's not the first, and I unfortunately I have to say, for sure it's not going to be the last law that we have to face and we have to fight against. Uh, but um, this is when we're always saying, and I'm always saying, and I'm really proud to be a member of this community called Momentum, because it's not just a political party, that this is why we have to change the government. Nobody going to solve this issue from outside Hungary. Um, we need uh, support. We, we have to work together. And I'm really glad when, when uh, we can meet people who do the same work in other countries, because we, are belong to, we belong to the same community called the European Union. So we have to uh, help each other. But we, we have to um, take, it, take, take the political will in our own hand and turn into action. Um, and when I'm looking at this law, of course, the first thought was like, again, uh, it's a copycat of the Russian law. It's one step further to, to be, be claimed that we are as bad as Russia. Uh, however, unfortunately, I have to say it's even worse. This Hungarian law is worse than the Russian one um, because it's not a copy-paste law. The Hungarian law, even in its name, connects homosexuality with pedophilia. This is something unforgettably disgusting. Uh, 
uh, I'm not protecting the Russian law. I'm not saying that is nothing yeah, but worrisome. Also the, but Russian, the Russian initiative also started and uh, beginning in 2012, actually, with with linking, with saying an act that they were going to take actions against pedophilia. So with, this is a thing, of course, that you see developing all over Europe all the time, all over autocratic countries all the time. First, try to frame homosexuals, trans people as as as, as pedophiles and so on. And and this is really, I mean, it's a really disgusting thing, as you say. Yeah. True, and I also believe that as the Russian law, we also could face such a similar law, uh, the uh, Lex NGO law, which was also um, 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 the, the, the European uh, Court of Justice also found it uh, uh, against the European law. Now they modified it, it's as bad as before, just differently, so we can start the process again. But that law never been used. Such the Russian law is not as particularly uh, um, naming and punishing uh, people who are um, showing homosexuality, but it's enough that it's there and nobody understands what the, what the will behind the law, therefore uh, it's causing a chilling effect already just to being announced. Uh, but, but comparing to the Hungarian law, uh, it's a little bit, it went further. Of course, we don't know the details yet because they haven't announced that. Uh, however, um, the Russian law says that the picturing or promotion of non-traditional uh, sexual relationship among um, uh, minors is forbidden. Mm -hmm. The Hungarian law, in, in, in contrary, is not just saying that. It's also saying that, that portraying or promotion of one's uh, uh, sexual identity which differs from the birth identity, birth sex, is in the same category. It's basically in a name, uh, the legal language, it says that's not just about homosexuals, but also transsexuals, intersexuals, uh, and it's not just saying that it cannot be portrayed, it cannot be talked about, mm -hmm. and it's not just important about the protecting minors who are looking for the sexuality or they realize that they, uh, they, um, uh, they are a member or, or the part of the LGBTQ community, but also other students cannot hear about that such different sexual identities or sexual orientation exist, which again just helps hateful pro propaganda to, to go further and further because if people doesn't know what they are talking about, it's easy to hate something you don't know. It's easy to be afraid of something you never met or at, you at, at least you believe you never met because there's so many people among us, mm -hmm. not just in this room. I so agree with you. It's, it's so important that every, every child, every young person learns uh, to develop an uh, inclusive attitude towards everybody. Uh, if you're not informed, how, how do you do that? So it's, yeah, I totally agree that it, 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 uh, it limits life and, and possibilities of life, not only for LGBT uh, children, but, but for all children. Mm -hmm. yeah, one of the things also with this law, and I mean, as you were saying, it's not the first time, it's not going to be the last time that Orban was doing this. So many, many people were shocked, but honestly, I mean, we can probably agree amongst us, we were not shocked about this. Um, we, saw how, we saw already in 2020, uh, Orban uh, and his government banning legal gender changes and specifically starting to target trans people actually and this is something that has been going on for years this anti-gender uh, rhetoric the claiming uh, trans people as, as, as gender ideology and so on and you were the first trans uh, member of the of the of the Dutch Parliament um, yeah it often starts actually with targeting trans people um, how do you feel about that yeah, I don't know. It, it's a weird thing that people are, uh, indeed, I recognize your observation, people mm -hmm. are extra scared uh, of mm -hmm. transgender people. I don't know why, um, because in general we are very nice people. I can <laughs> speak of experience. Um, I don't know. I, I think by just being transgender, uh, just by having undergone this whole process of who am I and is this uh, congruent with my uh, the, the sex that I got assigned at birth, um, that whole uh, the fact that you pose those questions, uh, well, the, the questions are deep and the impact is huge. And I think a lot of people are scared of asking themselves those deep questions about who am I, what's my purpose in life, and how do I bring myself forward in this world. So um, we challenge them in a way. We challenge them to ask questions about themselves they don't like to ask, mm -hmm. and they blame us for it. But it's their problem. So I think it's very important that transgender people um, 
are, vi are visible. Yes. And I'm very, very happy to have been elected in our uh, Dutch parliament as the first openly transgender person. Mm -hmm. I want to underline that openly transgender person. Maybe we've seen lots of them, but we didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a perfect choice for a transgender person not to be explicit about it, not to be visible as being trans. Um, and then again, uh, some of us need to be visible and speak out uh, because that helps uh, well, evolve the discussion and helps um, educate all people uh, that transgender people can be nice people. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, was, I also want to ask the question to Anastasia, actually. I was going to say, let's, let's go to, to Russia, but you were in the States. So, um, so if, if, I, I, it's, I think this is really something that has changed. In Russia, the focus was not back in 2013 so much on trans people. It didn't really start with trans people. Well, am, am, I, am I reading this wrong, in your opinion? <coughs> With uh, trans issues in Russia, it's um, um, it's a difficult topic because um, I feel like um, trans people are very isolated in Russia. Um, basically, we don't have a strong social justice movement. That uh, um, uh, uh, these movements, for example, in the United States, they are very inclusive and um, they are very intersectional. They usually include feminist uh, people and uh, queer, queer people of different uh, kinds. Uh, different sexual uh, identities and gender identities. Uh, in Russia, even uh, feminist um, activists who are for, uh, well, they claim that they support gender equality, but they often exclude uh, trans people from uh, the community, and they are often even against uh, trans uh, trans people and uh, trans issues. For example, um, I'm a gender non-conforming per person. Uh, I'm assigned female at birth, and often the Russian feminists would tell me that you present yourself this way uh, solely because it's patriarchy, and uh, you just don't like to be a woman in a patriarchal society, and uh, you need to uh, present as woman, and you need to uh, make women more uh, empowered uh, in Russia. And uh, it's a little bit difficult, so I, I think that overall trans people um, in Russia, they are not visible, uh, and um, neither the authorities nor the activists talk uh, all that much about trans issues. Um, and. Uh, at some point, or on a certain level, it's probably even good because they are not that targeted compared to, for example, gay people. But when it comes to a uh, violation of uh, uh, trans, uh, transgender rights, uh, the first uh, story that comes to my mind is um, the situation with uh, the person, uh, I think, uh, their... Um, uh, their current name is Francis, Francis Savinovsky, uh, but most people know uh, the story, uh, the, the person under their dead name, uh, Yulia Savinovsky, you, you can easily Google the story. So basically this ber person assigned female at birth, she uh, undergone uh, mastectomy uh, and um, um, they were married to a man uh, and they adopted two kids before uh, they undergone uh, uh, mastectomy. Uh, and uh, the authorities, they took the kids away from this family, but not because uh, they assumed um, that um, uh, Yulia Francis uh, ch changed their gender. They, they, they did assume that, but they said that it's not because they are transgender, but because it's not, now it is the same sex couple, because they are now homosexual people. So, you know, they kind of target the LGBTQ community from a little bit different standpoint. Um, and um, I uh, cannot uh, say that um, they necessarily target uh, transgender people all that much just because transgender people in Russia, unfortunately, they either uh, try not to undergo the medical transition and they just um, basically they're in the closet and they uh, present themselves uh, with the gender assigned at birth. Or they put um, extreme efforts, like ludicrous efforts to pass as cisgender people when they go through transition and then in that case uh, they basically almost don't uh, deal with um, that much discrimination just because people the society they assume that they are cisgender but uh, I might be wrong because uh, my experience is slightly different. I uh, I came up uh, came out as a gender non-conforming person being already outside of Russia um, 
Uh, but um, according to the news, I don't see that uh, many news about discrimination of necessarily uh, trans, uh, trans people in Russia, but uh, yeah. Yeah, d those are very interesting observations. Um, uh, two things I want to uh, com comment about. Um, I totally recognize this urge of some transgender people to uh, fully qualify in the uh, gender that they didn't get assigned at birth. Um, but I would like to uh, emphasize that if you as a trans person feel pushed or obliged to conform to that stereotype, then that there's another way of not being free. So I would hope and I would uh, uh, love everybody to feel the opportunity to really um, investigate who am I and how do I want to express myself. And it should not be obliged to be either side of this, this whole uh, 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 broad spectrum. So, um, but I totally recognize that in some countries being a non-binary person, and that's what we're talking about, um, uh, is, is, is more difficult than in other countries. Um, and another interesting observation uh, is that indeed radical feminists oppose very heavily uh, yes. uh, to, to trans women because they feel that we take away uh, their uh, privileges that they fought for over decades um, and they feel um, that we are males dressed in dresses to invade in their private space to rape them and I, did, I don't make this up, this is the, literally the narrative they use I think it's horrific because it's, uh, at, uh, first of all, it's a uh, denial of the existence of transgender, uh, of, of, of the possibility of being transgender. And uh, uh, second, uh, it's an association between trans people and rapists. And third of all, it's also an association of all males being rapists, which isn't true. Um, so, uh, well, they, they really put effort in being radical feminists. Um, and I really hope that they um, learn to see that we fight the same enemy. We fight the male dominant privileged uh, structures in, in society. So we should team up instead of fight each other. I, yes. I, I never understand the, the basis of that logic. I mean, the more the merrier, isn't it? Exactly. I mean, we are, we are f far from equality and we are far from what's the aims of feminism. So why we are not welcoming more people to fight together with us? Exactly. Yes. But that's also, also including males, yeah, feminist males. Absolutely. But we also need to be honest, even within the LGBTIQ movement itself at the moment, you see a growing tendency of, of, of LGB people who are actually attacking trans people at the, at the moment. So we see this whole turf LGBT, uh, LGB alliance, especially in the UK and in France, establishing and becoming more and more powerful. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very concerning thing. I want to go a bit further on, on, on now on the, on the Hungarian law itself, because we've seen a huge backlash, European, internationally. Um, um, we've seen a lot of pressure from our European countries, especially Western European countries, but only Western European countries, also Baltic countries, on Hungary now in the last in the last weeks. We even had uh, Prime Minister Rutte from the Netherlands saying at some point, if Hungary is not going to withdraw these laws, then Hungary has to leave the, the EU. I mean, this is legally not possible. But how do you feel again as a Hungarian about a Western European, another head of government from a, from a, from a European country, basically saying y you need to leave the EU? Well, if I'm criticizing anything about the comments of Mark Rutte, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, is that unfortunately he used the word Hungary. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because nor, like, I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised that lately all the leaders are paying attention to divide the Hungarian government from Hungary. Uh, and, and this has always been really important for me from the beginning that I started my mandate in the European Parliament to always state Hungary doesn't equal Viktor Orban. Um, and when we hear such comments, they obviously talk about the government and it's obviously that it's a part of politics. They're sending message back to their home country. And European citizens are also feel that this uh, law is shameful. Mm -hmm. The whole European community feels it. Therefore, their leaders have to express it. From a Hungarian perspective, after almost 12 years living under this regime, this autocratic regime, we are a little bit um, neutral or even I can say fed up 
of um, harsh comments <laughs> from Europe. I mean, this is our reality. I mean, it's easy to say, um, to hold a political speech about, uh, you know, being strong and sending a message, another thing to live under that autocratic regime. However, as I always mentioned, uh, I also mentioned before, um, it's our job to change on that. And I think the stronger, the harsher comments they receive, diplomatically it comes. And right now there is a political momentum to not uh, stop being harsh. Because there is nothing in Viktor Orban's hand to veto. Right now there is a European political momentum that finally they can express that enough is enough. And I think now it's, it's, uh, they went a little bit too far because they have a lot to lose. It's not, I'm not just talking about the infringement procedure, which are going to be launched soon, of course. First letter sent to the government, they're going to reply something um, <laughs> yes uh, to be diplomatic. Uh, but it's not, uh, it's, it's not about that. It's going to happen because it, obviously there is at least five parts of this law which goes against uh, the treaties, that goes against European law. On the other hand, I'm really proud that uh, there are some commissioners who already showed how important their job is for them. Uh, and I want to name one of them, uh, the Commissioner for Equality, Helena Dali, who also showed in regarding Poland, when Poland introduced the LGBTQ uh, free zones, um, that her response was to script all those um, um, EU funds for those municipalities who named their area as LGBT-free zones. Because it said that European money goes for projects which respect equality, because all European citizens have to receive that money. And if they um, 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 discriminate Polish people, those municipalities doesn't deserve a penny. And as far as I know, one or two municipalities meanwhile switch back. They, they are not a part of, uh, of this hateful campaign because of that. And Helena Dali right away named that he's, she's looking into how to maybe use the same measures towards Hungary. And we are not talking about municipal project this time. These are big amounts of money. But I'm, and this is the last thing I have to mention. Again, we cannot be happy about the things because if it happens, it's going to uh, cause harm for Hungarians at the end of the day. Because the European Union was not created in order to give tools to its leaders to punish a member state. It's not, it's not the concept. So we have to change our government uh, because in short run, it can be harmful for the government, but in the long run, it's our loss as Hungarian citizens. Yeah, I, I understand, totally understand that. You know, um, uh, I'm very proud that the uh, Hungarian people are part of the European Union. I'm very happy to uh, be one well, family. Um, but what of course worries me is that the fact that there's a government uh, in place here that doesn't respect uh, fundamental European values. And of course, as a European Union, we need to speak up for that. And um, uh, withdrawing all the money, well, I, I totally uh, agree with you, that could be harmful towards very uh, supportive projects for the Hungarian society, so you could harm Hungarian people with that. Um, um, but then again, if you install specific monitoring instruments to see whether or not the money is uh, not used for uh, increased propaganda of the Orban uh, 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 government, um, uh, but is solely used for really social support projects, uh, well, th that can be very harsh because who is doing the monitoring? Is it a Hungarian institution or is it an uh, EU institution? If it's an EU institution, uh, well, there are some legal issues about whether or not they are allowed to investigate uh, thoroughly here in this country. Thank God there are a legal uh, thresholds to prevent uh, uh, European countries to invade uh, each other. Um, so how do you really fix that you uh, get this monitoring um, to really be objective and neutral and to really, well, dig up the information to navigate the money where it's supposed to go? Yeah, do you have any ideas on that? 
Well, I think it's all um, uh, the matter of uh, deeper European integration. Uh, we have to um, uh, create an European level of, uh, a more systematic uh, monitoring system. Right now, the Commission's answer always is that they don't have human resources, they don't have the instrument, they don't have the capacity. This is why it's uh, actually um, delivered to the member states uh, a responsibility to also monitor. But I think they already understand that it's not going to happen. Uh, this is why it was a big deal to create the uh, EPPO which again, Hungary is not a part of, but we're going to change the government next year and we're going to join the EPPO, so it's <laughs> going to be checked. But um, we still have to go further. So it's not... Uh, autocrat autocratic regimes comes and goes. We always talk about Hungary and Poland, like, okay, if we solve these issues, it's a happy big EU, EU but it's a, they already started a domino effect. And I think slowly you, uh, the Commission also realized that uh, they have to change on the implementation of, uh, of, of a fund distribution and monitoring uh, system and so on because it's not going to, to work out in the long run. But the monitoring system is of course one thing, but it starts from the beginning and money should not go to countries or to, or to governments. Who are not uh, who are not in line with rule of law and democracy, and and therefore the rule of law conditionality conditionality is so important. It's important that 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 the European Parliament now is actually obliging also the European Commission to use this rule of law mechanism that they that they, that they have implemented last December, and we see that the European Commission is still lacking to do so. So, and in the same in the same line, I want to go to to you, Bart, because of course, like Anna was saying, the Commission has taken action uh, last. Summer, uh, but withdrawing some of the of the funding from um, from these from a few from six LGBT free zones in Poland, um, but was this enough actually? Did the Commission do enough? I mean, that is, in politics there is no accident. There are signs, and the sign of that of this big change that was uh, going to Poland was those actually those LGBT free zones, which are the common name for the statements against so-called LGBT ideology, which was uh, introduced in man man municipalities across Poland. And for us as activists, it was a warning point that we need to start our fight right now, like for real. And uh, of course, it was not enough. I mean, the first um, cancellation of the man that came from the, uh, those, uh, between the, the, this city partnership project. Was to, it was very small amounts, it was about 40,000 uh, euro per each uh, city. And then the big change came from the Norway, when Norway cancelled the fund for the LGBT free zones, like the big fund, like 60 million of złotych, so it's about 4, 5 million euro. And so it all started that about six months apologies turned their, uh, which draw their uh, documents, also Ombudsman Office, which was very helpful to uh, make compliance uh, against those uh, resolutions of the municipalities, which came to the court and court told that it was against the Polish constitution to discriminate people. And it was obvious for us that we need some kind of help from the from 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 the European Union, which is not just the bank where we can take the money, uh, but there are some values inside of it, and uh, it it started. I remember how uh, was the reaction of uh, Ursula von der Leyen, and so she told that those zones are which out the zones against humanity, and uh, for activists in Poland it meant a lot. But still, symbolic acts are not enough. We need action, and if we are at the table, there are players, there are Hungary, there are Orbán, there's Kaczynski, there is Duda maybe somewhere. So uh, I think that we need bold politicians, bold statements and bold, a bold actions. If the European Union will be not at the table, so there will be other players out there who you will use the all advantages of this, that the European Union is still making uh, policies but not politics. Yes, and I think it's also worth to mention the way that, 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 uh, that, uh, that the Polish government dealt with, with, the, with the news uh, of, of, of this little money that was being withdrawn by the European Commission because it was indeed 20 to 40,000 euros every time. And the reaction, you remember it as well, the reaction of Biegne Jobro, the Minister of Justice in Poland, was just, okay, if the EU does not give you the money, then I'm going to triple the money. 
So it's and important to everybody yes, because yes. the stronger uh, the, man, the message should be very strong, and the only strong message did not come from from the European Commission. It came from from the Norwegian funds. So not from the Commission. Because they, they, I can imagine that Norway is a bit faster than the mechanism in the European Union. They are famous for, for, their, for what, what, that they are slow. So, um, and their slow reaction of the Commission is not that we, can, we, we are expecting this justice which, which is uh, coming after years, like in the Strasbourg. So uh, is it still justice, I could ask. I, I, I mean that we are in the crisis and we should acknowledge it. We are in the crisis of human rights. We are in the crisis of LGBT rights too because this, this whole movement against the trans people which is slowly going also inside to the Poland against the transgender rights is trying to erase the T from the LGBT movement. I, I need to underline there is no move LGBT movement without trans people and it should be acknowledged by the, all of the people who are fighting for the, for the, for the, for the human rights. And we should also acknowledge that this is the battle where we need to dedicate ourselves. It's not just about telling and giving symbolic acts. I, I really appreciate the uh, European LGBT Freedom Zone. I mean, uh, European Freedom Zone. Uh, it's, it, it was necessary, but what next? Inside of this beautiful idea, Hungary came with the, another step because the first, I could say, first or second, the first was the ban of the marriage in, in, included into the uh, constitution. The second step was the ban uh, on, the, on the change of the birth certificates. So uh, there was science before. Why we didn't react it? Why the European Union didn't react it? Now I, I, can, I could say it's a bit late because the law is now in, in, in the power. We are just in the vacatio legis uh, of it, so it will be soon in the real power. So me as an activist from Poland, I want the reaction of the European Union, the full force of it, and all of the countries, the bold countries who has the equality, and they can put their own sanctions on the, on the Hungary, on the Polish government, of the Hungarian government, why, why, why they are waiting? I mean, uh, the thing what I am very proud about that happened recently was uh, the Secretary of State of, from France that made a visit to Poland. He made a promise in the December 2020 that he will came and he made it. What I am, as a ac non-partisan activist, uh, what I like when the politicians hold their promises, it's not something very obvious and not so much uh, common. And uh, yeah, it's really time for the, for the bold politicians, not just bold statements. Yes, so indeed, it's, 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 we, we have, we've probably had enough symbolism, it's, it's time for action. Thank you very much, Bart, for saying that. Um, let's, let's, let's go again to the United States to talk a bit about Russia. Uh, <laughs> um, what, I mean, well, one of the things that we've seen, and Budapest has hosted one of these conferences as well, is that we see an, an, an establishment of ultra-conservative organizations all around uh, Europe. Uh, we've seen uh, Budapest and the Hungarian Minister for Family Affairs, Katalin Novak, has hosted in 2017 the World Congress of Families, an American-based uh, organization which is well known for their campaigns against marriage equality, against trans people, and so on. It's a very well organized. They have links with the Kremlin. Uh, the Kremlin is one of the main funders of that. Um, but for me, and that was always part of my, my own research, um, I mean the links between the links and the reasons why Russia is, is so much involved um, in, in these anti-LGBTIQ movements all around the world is not so much because they hate LGBTIQ people, of course they do, but that's not the only reason. It's because that's a way of destabilizing Europe, that's a way of destabilizing democracies around the world and to, and to, and to, um, and to yeah, spread their worldview, to spread their worldview. Um, so yeah, I wanted to come to you, Anastasia, as well about, about this. Um, there is this whole anti-LGBTI, ultra-conservative um, rhetoric sent out as part of the disinformation campaigns of, of Russia. Why is Russia doing it, in your opinion? I think it's an attempt to create um, the new strong Russian national identity and it is very, very sad that they do it through basically opposing all of the values that they consider Western values. Um, uh, and um, they uh, try to create this uh, new 
post-Soviet identity based on uh, traditional values. It's a very interesting blend of um, interpretation of uh, orthodox uh, Christian values uh, plus um, Muslim values because in, in Russia we have 15% of uh, Muslim population and uh, basically Kremlin supports uh, all um, all all the things that are happening in Chechnya. We all know that um, uh, hundreds of gay people were oppressed, uh, disappeared in Chechnya. Uh, the honor killings in Chechnya is still the case. And as far as I know, Chechen community in Europe um, even uh, um, keeps tracking their, the people who try to escape uh, and uh, they can um, find them even in Europe and, and cause some harm. Uh, and basically, it started uh, inside the country. They started to uh, try to bring the society together based on this violent uh, tradi so-called traditional values. And now they are trying to spread this uh, messed up agenda abroad, basically. They try to push it. And uh, I think it, it can be both a tool to destabilize situation in certain countries, but uh, I also think that um, they generally want to to bring this ideology to Europe to uh, kind of promote uh, this. Uh, uh I don't know even no I don't even know how to call it, but uh, basically this uh, new Russian Eastern European set of values, uh, and it is very very sad indeed. But um, I do believe in Russian interference in the U.S. election. I moved to the United States from Russia in 2016, right before Trump got elected. Uh, it was very very sad because. Um, I suffered from uh, political oppression for uh, the uh, past 10 years before I uh, moved out from the country. And then I moved to the United States, and here we go again. Uh, 2016, Trump got elected. Uh, my, uh, my friends, my whole community uh, was crying that night. It was very heartbreaking. But uh, uh, luckily, it all uh, changes, you know, in democratic societies. Even uh, if you sometimes feel that there is this step back and uh, Kremlin tries to push it and basically feed uh, the Western um, populations, the Western uh, nations with uh, this terrible propaganda, um, people still, um, still realize at some point that something is wrong here. So it was really, really uh, nice to see that um, the, um, at least the American society uh, sobered up to, to a certain degree. There is still a large percent of conservative anti-LGBTQ people in the United States, don't get me wrong, but um, I think many people in the United States uh, uh, during uh, the uh, tr Trump uh, first and only one term, they realized that it's gone way too far, actually. So I really hope that uh, even though Kremlin is strong, Russian Malayan influence is, um, gets uh, very strong, it, it is very upsetting, it is very scary, but uh, I do think that uh, in, uh, in the strong countries, in the strong, uh, where there is strong civic society, still um, the more liberal part of the society can still promote its agenda, promote tolerance, and then the society will understand that um, that's how we want to live, actually, in a more kind and more, um, more inclusive world. Yeah, you really sometimes have the feeling, while you, of course, see the ultra-conservative organizations are becoming better and better organized, we still see that, if we look at the opinion polls, we see that there is still progress on the, and, 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 and the views of people on LGBTIQ uh, and Q, Q rights. Um, but um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, because recently we saw an announcement of Ordo Iuris, the, the, the world-famous anti-LGBTIQ organization of Poland, uh, that they will open an office here in Budapest. Um, I think the Hungarian activists are very keen to know what they should expect, because you have been yourself uh, quite a lot of a target uh, of, uh, of campaigns of Ordo Iuris. Yes, when we are speaking about Russia, so now we are yes, going uh, to the Order Juris. Of course, we are going to Order Juris yes. immediately. <laughs> yes, the Order Juris is quite influent uh, NGO in Poland, established by the prominent lawyers, and they are quite good lawyers, we need to acknowledge that, and they are quite good to use the democratic tools against democracy in the country, against the activists. They are 
recent step is to intimidate activists by the lawsuits they create with the help of the municipalities who fear uh, defamated, like by the action of the activists. And it's the others of hate, the virtual map of Poland, and the owners who created it, the LGBT activists, uh, they collected the all municipalities who declare themselves as discriminatory against the LGBT rights. And so uh, they, has, they got like six lawsuits uh, and those was convoyed by the uh, order juris. It, there is many actions like against the women rights movement uh, also convoyed by the order juris. Uh, they work quite closely with the government and they are quite keen of how to sell these ideas, uh, how to say about uh, the, the ultra fundamentalistic ideas they have in their minds. The, the, the first thing they are doing is to not tell about banning anything. Uh, to not tell that we want to ban gay marriage. We want to protect the families, we want to protect the kids, we want to restore the natural order, so-called natural order. And so they are fighting for it and they are doing quite well in Poland with the close connection to the government, uh, meeting with the judges, it's the, the knowledge we share and we know about this. When I hear that they uh, established the, 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 their office in, in, in Hungary, so it's another step. They want to have uh, their, their, their agents here to, to share the experience. I, I can even imagine that they, they know even better what is happening in Hungary than what the politicians are, because they are really dedicated to what they are doing. They really believe into what they are doing. Politicians sometimes not. Uh, they are just cynical. And here we see the group of very dedicated, ultra-Orthodox uh, Catholics too. Uh, because they also the, the, the name them, call them for, the, for Catholics, and they share those views, and they really are on the battle with, with the human rights against them. So I think that what, what we should acknowledge that we have a very big problem with the ultra right wing NGOs, which are infiltrating our uh, society, our system, our legal system too, which has no good intention. Uh, and they are willing to use these old democratic tools like lawsuits to defend yourself against activists, uh, the whistleblowers, and other people. So it's not just about LGBT activists. There will be other activists who will be also targeted. And we need, as the European Union, also need to find the, the ways to protect civil rights defenders from those horrible slap tactics. So, so it's the strategic lawsuits against public participations because it's, a, it's an equal war. Where when we as activists has a big opponents with the government which stay behind this, those NGOs and we who, who need to defend ourselves find the money for the legal defense and uh, defamation which is against us uh, in the public TV, in the other media which is pro-government, it's some, it's unequal from the very beginning, so against the common law of the idea. I think that we need to be aware we should put the finger of, of those uh, NGOs which are uh, pro-government and which are fighting against those democratic values. Yeah, and this is in my experience a worldwide phenomenon, so... Uh, yes, that's what I wanted to ask you immediately. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I totally yeah. recognize this yes. because um, you see it in all countries. You see it in the UK, you see it in the US, you also see it in the mm. Netherlands, that there are uh, conservative Christian uh, groups um, protecting va family values, you know, the narrative s sounds familiar. We are so worried about our children, we are so worried about the well-being uh, of transgender people, we need to protect them from mm -hmm. doing anything silly. Um, yeah. And they, uh, they are well-funded, so they have a lot of marketing power and they use it on not only on LGBT issues but also on birth control issues and uh, uh, abortion issues. Um, um, to illustrate, um, when I uh, entered Parliament in the Netherlands uh, three months ago, or yeah, three and a half, uh, of course you get a huge tsunami of, of, of letters and packages of people who want to well, put their uh, interest in your attention. Um, please uh, speak out for us, please speak out for us. And the uh, conservative Christian organizations, they sent me a little box with a letter in it. And uh, not only a letter where they 
put forward their ideas towards uh, banning uh, abortion, but they also put in a tiny little plastic mm -hmm. thing. And you see the same. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the moment you open the, the, the little box, this fetus mm -hmm. falls uh, into your lap. So they are really focusing and anticipating on shocking you mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and by doing that trying to, well, uh, to bring their message. And they have, uh, I think, growing connections to political parties all over the world, uh, at least uh, also here, uh, not here, there in the Netherlands. Um, some of the really conservative Christian political parties are very willing to listen to that narrative of those organizations and that's some, something that really concerns me um, because like you say uh, it's packed in this huge caring uh, narrative oh, we, we, we want the best for everybody uh, and we know the best what to do um, yeah, and, and the radical feminists we spoke earlier uh, about, uh, they team up with those conservative Christian groups to target transgender people. Um, and it's something I really uh, am worried about because their power is seems to be growing. Uh, yes, it's, I mean, I think it's really important also to say that this is not just a problem of Central and Eastern Europe. It's not a problem exactly. of post-communist countries that we have. We see this is, we know that Geert Welders in the Netherlands, he is very close with Viktor Orban. And the week that there was so much media attention to the, to the anti-LGBTQ law here in Hungary, one of the main members of the European Parliament of Vlaams Belang, the, the main political party in Flanders and Belgium at the moment, was was literally tweeting LGBTIQ as a liberal Sharia, as it's 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 a religion. That's and so we see this anti-LGBTIQ rhetoric coming back everywhere in Europe at the moment. It's stronger and strong, becoming stronger and stronger. So yeah, let's focus on the solutions maybe. <laughs> um, and I and. and we see and we and we see that this ultra conservative movement is, is very well organized. What can we as 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 as, as and very, in very general terms European liberal forces do to 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 to, to counter uh, all of that? Well, I believe that we should focusing on solutions from direction that may be not that obvious. Uh, what Bart said is super important. Uh, we, we just started to work on SLAP uh, regulation within the European Parliament. And when I, when I started to talk in Hungary about SLAPs, nobody really understood what, well, why is it important. Because it, just because it, we are not saying right away that well, the chilling effect, how, inf how COVID influences uh, every people's life, but especially activists and NGOs and LGBTQ uh, communities and so on, it doesn't mean that, um, that we should we have to start this education to show that how many different directions you can make change in order to actually finding solution what we are talking about today. Uh, and it's not just finding a solution how to regulate SLAP, so how we can counter-regulate SLAPs and uh, how we can support those NGOs and communities and human rights defenders who has to face uh, those. But also we have to start talking about shrinking space of civic society in Europe it's not just in Hungary and Poland, it's all over Europe. We have to start openly talk about the gongos, as you said, so the, the pro-government and non-governmental organizations, which is ridiculous, but it, it happens. I think uh, Hungarians knows it very well, uh, because there is more and more every day in Hungary. Um, and I also believe that we have, I know it sounds harsh, but uh, we have to focus on how to not, not, not letting um, populists and ultras or, or, or ultra conservatives bringing these issues to the level of identity politics because from that moment on, unfortunately, they win. Mm -hmm. We have to show them that if we really believe that there's nothing to see here because we believe in equality, uh, equality between heterosexuals, homosexuals, gays, uh, transsexuals, and so on and so forth. Then let's start to talk about policies which really matters in the everyday regularity, including those measures in it which particularly focusing and helping for the community we are talking about. Because once uh, people see that we all face the same problems and issues, we all need the same help from our states, then there could be more solidarity. And of course, when such laws are introduced that we started this conversation, it doesn't help to start openly talking about these issues because 
we talked a lot about how, why they started to use the war against transgenders, why, how, why it works so well, although um, the transgender community um, um, is really like, most of them are hiding. We don't know uh, so many transgender, openly transgender people. This is why they can use uh, um, uh, them as a scapegoat. Because, for instance, in Hungary, most of the people, I believe, mixing up in mind transgenders and transvestites. So when you use the word transgender, they, they imagine something harsh and something too much and something too sexual, something that I don't want. They don't even know what we are talking about. They don't even know that it's about persons. So when we are listening about uh, promotion of um, homosexuality, I don't even know, where propaganda of LGBTQ propaganda, uh, I really need a definition from our government because I can't imagine, especially when they're talking about uh, uh, transgenders, you really think that people for trend, they would say, ah, I want to go to surgeries, it's so much fun. I mean, I, are you really kidding me? But because we're not talking about the mental process behind it, uh, the physical process, I think even if after 15 minutes, if, if somebody would sit down with a transgender person, they would say, oh Lord, if you go through that, the same about abortion, by the way, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous that uh, uh, this ultra conservative talks about it like it's fun for women to go on abortion. So I think solutions is coming from different directions, but mostly it has to go underground up, like a, a bottom up approach. Visual we started talking because once people won't, uh, it, once this whole issue won't be unknown for people, it won't be that easy for populists to, to create fear and hateful propaganda based on that fear. Mm -hmm. But if they don't know what they hate, it's easy to hate. Um, so our job is, is going further than what politicians can do. It's not only politicians' job to do, but as also what Bart said, politician has to be responsible of their words and actions. And, and they also have to be responsible what they promise. Because many times it's easy, from, especially from opposition, to promise a lot of things. And once you get the power and you realize it's not that easy to change, but then they are acting like nothing happened. Instead of facing people and said, it's not that simple. But we, first of all, politicians have to learn to talk openly about that. Um, I believe in this issue and I'm going to do my best but I can't promise to solve it by tomorrow. Mm. Because these issues need a lot of time, not just policy-wise, but changing mentality. It takes generation, but we have to start. We stop, have to stop talking in a political level and start talking in a civic level. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add uh, a few things. I, I agree, I think it's a joint effort. So it's politicians who need to take action, it's NGOs who need to take action, it's politicians facilitating NGOs to be able to take action. But there's also uh, uh, the, the, the commercial companies that have a responsibility, in my view. Um, large multinational companies have a huge advocating power that they don't use enough in my view, uh, um, because a lot of populist uh, uh, politicians are very sensitive to money. Well, um, um, that's something that large multinational companies um, provide to, uh, to a, a country. They provide jobs, they provide tax money flowing in. Um, so with that position, they have a huge advocating power and they should speak up uh, explicitly and uh, more often uh, to my view um, and next to that what would really be helpful is to address the right problem because we are talking about the uh, uh, LGBT issue here um, but that's yeah you use the word scapegoat um, in a way it's just some kind of diversion to uh, lead the attention away of the fundamental problem that lies underneath why is it possible to create laws, anti-LGBT anti uh, laws like this? It's because that there, uh, there are fundamental flaws in the way that societies, uh, 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 especially in populist uh, governments, uh, uh, there are flaws in the way that they govern the country. They are uh, um, corrupt, they are uh, uh, use nepotism to um, uh, appoint friends uh, uh, into specific strategic positions and by doing that they sort of
pull down the, 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 the ground a solid open democracy stands on, mm -hmm. they pull it away. And by doing that, uh, they create a risk for all people living in the country. So this law is just a symbol for the risk that, in my view, uh, all people uh, uh, yes. have. So um, we should team up. Yes, this oh, again, yeah, visibility is really the key. And I want to go to, to, to Anastasia, because maybe we can learn something from Russia, actually. Uh, what we have seen over the last months is that that's what these uh, democracy protests linked to the, to the poisoning and the arrest of Alexei Navalny, that a, lot of, uh, that a lot of, especially young people, took the streets. And we saw a lot of queer people also taking the streets in, 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 uh, in, in Russia. And of course, situation, democratic situation in Russia is way harder than we have here in, 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 um, in, in Europe. But how can we learn from Russia? How can European progressives, European liberals um, take the streets again, take their space and democracy again? Uh, I need to uh, correct you here a little bit because, uh, as I said before, in Russia we don't have um, a strong social justice movement. Um, so basically there is no unity um, among uh, the Russian opposition. Even people who consider themselves liberal, uh, they are not necessarily pro-LGBTQ, they are not necessarily pro-feminist. Unfortunately, even uh, Navalny and Navalny team um, members of his team, uh, they were saying that um, if uh, Navalny would ever be elected, he will not support um, certain things, such as, for example, uh, gay, uh, gay pride, LGBTQ pride parade. It's, it's too excessive for, uh, for Moscow, and it's not something that the Moscovites want uh, in their city. Uh, so it was not explicitly homophobic, but we all understand um, what uh, what does uh, he mean actually? Which is very sad. I still support Alexei Navalny. I think he, he is a very brave person. But unfortunately, uh, the uh, Russian opposition movement is uh, very male dominated and. Um, Usually, uh, don't want to sound ageist, but I think uh, there is a generational component here. So I, I noticed that people who are a little bit older, they don't necessarily have good understanding of gender issues or um, sexuality issues. Um, whereas among people who are younger, who are in their 20s or even teenage uh, folks, they uh, watch YouTube, they watch Netflix, they watch uh, all these great TV shows on Netflix where they there is a large representation of different identities and different lifestyles, and they are getting more exposed to that, and um, they understand these issues way, way better. Uh, so I think um, it's, um, it's great that uh, younger people, younger YouTubers or TikTokers, they uh, share their knowledge, they find something uh, on the internet, uh, or for example, in American um, social media, they try to translate it and explain it to their audience. And then I also, uh, I was happy to see that uh, one of the Russian uh, national brands, it's not even an international corporation, it's just chain of grocery stores. Uh, this week they released um, publications on their social media about people who buy food in their grocery stores. And they casually mentioned a queer family where there were two, uh, two gay, uh, gay women, two lesbian women. Uh, which is also great. It's, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, in Russian circumstances, it is a very brave uh, and bold uh, decision to do that. <laughs> so I really hope that um, if not the leaders of the Russian opposition, uh, then probably just the younger people, the younger bloggers, uh, and maybe even some of the national companies, they uh, can support uh, the, the good agenda. So... Like really, ask, let me be very clear. Be very clear in my question: What has to happen in Russia for for the system to change, for pe for people, not just the government, for, but also for people to become more uh, more, more open towards LGBTQ people? Well, basically, the whole system should be <laughs> deconstructed completely uh, because um, people are so spoiled with, with propaganda. And unfortunately, it starts from very young age. Even in kindergartens, they feed uh, kids with all this uh, militaristic, uh, terrible, uh, traditional agenda. So it is very, very bad. Uh, but um, 
parents can educate their little kids. I know that some of uh, my friends, they already do it in their families. They just tell their kids that, you know, there are different families in this world. And uh, we actually have this joke among my group of friends that most Russians, they grew up uh, in um, they were raised by same-sex uh, couples, uh, a mom and a grandmother. So like, what's so uh, terrible about that actually, if we look at it this way? So basically, um, I don't believe that um, we can change in the nearest future, in the next two years, we can change anything at, at a systemic level. Let's be realistic. We don't have elections, basically. We don't have um, independent TV channels or radio stations. Uh, the opportunities for a systemic change are very, very limited. But let's work uh, in the area that we still can uh, control in a certain way. Uh, social media is a great, uh, great tool to spread uh, the, the, the good information, the correct information to educate people and I, I also agree um, with the previous speaker that sometimes people they just don't know they don't really know uh, what transgender people and who are intersex people and let's just share more stories um, about people who are you know slightly different than an average Russian citizen and I think uh, uh, YouTube is such a powerful tool when you read an article it's sometimes hard to emotionally relate to a story but when you actually see this person with all their emotions and all their vulnerability uh, it's much easier to relate and understand what uh, they are going through so I, I do believe in the power of YouTube more youtubers and um, uh, I also uh, hope that uh, some uh, independent activists in Russia, I know that try to raise funds abroad, um, and I know that it's, it's a little bit difficult to raise funds. For example, donors don't really like to support um, media projects or independent bloggers. I hope um, there will be more funding opportunities, including the European funding opportunities, so uh, we could see more independent, um, independent um, uh, bloggers and uh, civic journalists who educate people in Russia. Yes, uh, Bart, as well, you, you, you must love to hear that the power of YouTube, you're a videographer yourself. Um, you have made ma many documentaries uh, about LGBTQ people, about democratic movements, for instance, in Belarus and so on. Uh, what is your experience about yeah, sharing video, sharing, um, um, uh, to, to, yeah, sharing documentaries to change people's minds? I think that we need to find, <coughs> pardon, uh, we need to find uh, different approaches, different creative ideas of how to interest the people who are sitting in their iPhones. Uh, we need to find different creative ideas to create protest. We need to make people understand that civil disobedience is a right. We need to make people critical thinking. When politicians say that he know better than you what is good for you, it should be a warning point for us. Politicians never know what is good for their, uh, for the politi for, for the citizens, and so I think that we should uh, be uh, very conscious when politicians are saying. When I went today to the to the to the shop to the mall and I wanted to buy Coca Cola, and so I was so surprised that it's around it's 1,000 foreigns. And so I forget that there is inflation in, in, in Hungary. And so I came back to the, and so now Orban is focusing about banning LGBT people, uh, the right to, to, be, to visibility. So again, this is the, 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 what the populistic politicians are doing. They are not really interested in the people. They are interested in their own business. They are interested in, 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 in their money, in their relationships with the business. And so I totally agree about this uh, pr pressure that should be made on the business, especially in Hungary. If you are so proud about the values you, you bring to the city, to the place, uh, you should fight for them. And uh, so so it's also about the CSR. They, they, they are so much. I mean, the companies are so much uh, dedicated to to grow the CSR for the for the different things. Let them pay for what they are doing. Let the government also see that this is not the, the politics are also close to the business. So for me, I, I strongly believe that in my actions, in my projects, I. I, I 
brought some ideas to, to, to and I make them visible to everybody. It was so st so so hard to spot this new law that happened in Poland, this statements against the LGBT ideology, until I created the sign I put it under the name of the municipalities, which was so proud of this new uh, idea of fighting with the LGBT people. But they, then they was ashamed of it. So. We need to find different ideas, and I strongly believe into the civil disobedience that we, which has a very rich history, Rosa Park and um, Dr. King, and so we can learn a lot from our history because injustice law is, is not a law. The, the, what, just we, what we are just seeing is a new law. Should we uh, create disobedience or should we just stay with the line of this law? It's the question of the privilege because not everybody can afford this to, uh, to pay the penalties, to, go to, to, to face the criminal charges. Uh, but my message is strongly to the people who are the privileged one, who has the independence that they can use and afford to, to fight for the cause. And this is the, this is the, the thing that we we should all convoy right now. Yes, a deputy, prime, a deputy minister of justice in, in Poland also said uh, concerning the Hungarian law that they also are working on a similar draft law uh, to introduce in, in, in Poland. For me, it's very difficult to grasp how a country like Poland, who has suffered so much under Russian oppression, which actually, especially the government, is a very Russophobic government, still Kaczynski is, is basically accusing Russia of murdering his brother, um, and that even they are, convi are, are thinking about the law, which is so so similar to 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 to, to Russian interest basically um, yeah what can we do as Europeans to, to prevent the, the the Polish from 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 also going the same path of the as, as the Hungarians are I think that through past years in Poland LGBT community has this feeling that we are the part of the nation we are part of the state and will they will not get rid of us we are, we are also citizens and therefore we're going to fight for this country. If our government is fighting with us, so they're going to have a problem. Big protests that occurred when the, uh, the government put the hand on the women's rights was uh, an example of what is happening when the government is, is fighting with the citizens. And I think the same will happen with, if they will make their promise of fighting with the LGBT community again. So, and there was a very clear message from the women's strike and uh, pardon my English, they told fuck off my vagina and it was a very simple message to the government. Don't mess with the human rights, don't mess with our bodies and it was very simple. And the same message will go from the LGBT community, go from us. Yes. And this is a very simple message I have to the government, I have to the people who want, uh, who want to mess with the human rights. We, if you want to fight with us, we're going to have a peaceful fight with you because it's working. Yes, yes. Anna, you have mentioned several times, and I totally agree with that, that's, that the change has to come from within, from within the countries. But of course, many of the viewers also at home and from around Europe, they also want to do something. So what can people all around Europe, in your opinion, do to support LGBTIQ rights in Hungary, but also in Poland and so on? You, and so on. Yeah. Well, I wish that I could say that uh, there's only problem in Hungary or in Poland, therefore I would ask everybody from Europe to come to, uh, here to help or, or doing something from home. I think everybody has a huge job to do at home. I think we should support each other, but don't forget that LGBTQ rights uh, all over Europe is, uh, is in a struggle. Uh, there are worse situations. I mean, of course, I can't compare Hungary or Poland to the Netherlands, but as we heard, still it's far from ideal. So um, I, 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 I wanted to send a message to everybody, for those who are living in, in, a, um, in easier circumstances like the Dutch viewers, um, fight for keeping what you have. Don't take it as, as given. If we learned something in the past 12 years, that democracy is not something that politicians just sign over in a piece of paper, you have to fight for democracy on a daily basis. It's not given. Otherwise, politicians are going to take it away from you. And it's the same about all your rights. Because there are people who, as we already talked about it, they're only interested to keep and gain more, more power. What they need to do that is money, 
therefore corruption. They do everything uh, to make it anti-transparent. How is not just uh, behind doors type of money channeling and so on, but creating uh, um, uh, divisive laws where we as citizens or opposition politician can right away go on the street and protest. And now, I mean, it is a really tricky situation. We couldn't not go to the street and we couldn't just sit in our chairs and said, okay, we know that, uh, that this law is, uh, is, is n they're not homophobic, they just created a homophobic law. And they, to cover up all those corruption issues happening, that why they are bringing him here, the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party's uh, uh, private university, taking over the field and the opportunities of a, a student city, we call it, uh, which would basically give um, uh, um, students uh, uh, accommodation dormitories, thousands of students from Hungarian countryside. That was the topic before it was launched. Um, and they are really good in that because they know that we're going to stood up for the values we believe. But the more we talk about it, the least we are talking about corruption issues. Um, so it's a message for everybody to not, never, take, not, never believe that your rights are, are given. You have to fight even if you have it. It's, it's always can be taken away, it can, it can be misused. There is still no equality, nowhere in the world. Equality in front of law, equality between um, uh, genders or sex, the equality uh, workspace, equality uh, at home. So come, there's a lot we have to do. So um, we need, um, I think we need support and solidarity. Uh, many times people think that only legal or, or, or real actions can help, but sometimes a message, a smile, nowadays hopefully again, hug, can help way much more yes. to feel that we are not alone. Um, and, 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 and never forget, we are a part of the same community. It's always nice to feel that we are all European. We can be proud Hungarians and Dutch and Polish and Belgians, but at the same time, we can be proud European, which means if my rights is taken away, you're going to be pissed off as well. And we so weather, because we belong together. Um, so that's my message. Otherwise, yes, uh, there's a lot of uh, things we have to do because everything starts with political will. Yes. yes. So you have to gain first power in order to do that. And then we need really wise and aware, critical thinker citizens mm -hmm. to actually ask us and take us responsible whether we're doing that. Be it's why politicians do what they do because citizens also only learn from democracy that every four years they go to vote. And in between, we complain that it's not what they promised. No, we have a right in between to say if something going wrongly. And we learn it in a really, really painful, slow way, and now it's too late. They have two third majority. Uh, even our um, representative in the parliament, in the opposition, can do anything. Not like they're trying their very best, but it's another question. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of work in this sense. And of course, we always, well, why I'm really happy to be among you, because we need to learn from you, for instance, you're sitting in a parliament, in a parliament which is way much more democratic, but you're facing other difficulties of democracy, naming there's 19 parties in your parliament. Mm -hmm. But we have to learn because we have to be prepared once we're sitting in that parliament, I mean, our national parliament, how to do that, how to push through those values and those policies, which we're right now only talking about. Yeah. Yes, and that's actually the, 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 the before we give the floor to the to, to, the, to the people watching and uh, here tonight. Um, that's actually the question I wanted to, to my last question where I ended, wanted to end with. Um, let's try to, to to be a bit positive, to end a little bit positive, because I don't want everybody to go home very depressed now. Um, I mean, okay, there are a lot of things still to do in the Netherlands, but the Netherlands is really one of the countries who always has stood up for LGBTQ rights and, and, and who is one of the best examples in the world. What has been your key to success? Yeah, um, well, before answering your question, yeah. um, um, what I would like to add is that um, I would like to call upon everybody to understand that what is happening uh, here with the LGBT 
uh, uh, laws uh, is not only a concern for LGBT people, not only here uh, and uh, in, in Europe, but it's a concern for, should be a concern for everybody. Because now it's the LGBT, LGBT community, tomorrow it might be women, uh, the day after tomorrow, it, uh, it might be religious freedom that is at stake. It's the same dynamic that limits uh, freedom for all of us. So we have a collective responsibility to join in and fix this problem and get rid of the dynamic that's underneath this. So I think that's a very important uh, message to, uh, to convey. Um, and well, the secret to, uh, to becoming uh, the first transgender member of du Dutch Parliament, uh, I don't know if, the, if I have a specific recipe, but what's important to, <laughs> to uh, uh, understand is that yes, once we were uh, one of the leading companies, world uh, companies, uh, countries. <laughs> That's very Dutch to say. <laughs> <laughs> Where there's trade, there's, there are Dutch people, yeah. Uh, but we, are, we were the leading one of the leading countries uh, in the world uh, regarding to LGBT freedom, um, but it's something you need to fight on a daily basis. Everybody uh, uh, um, wants to get their interest in the front light uh, and push away interests of other groups. Uh, and I hope that one day we will learn that if I give you a bit more space, it doesn't take away my space. There's not an, a limit in the space there is uh, regarding humanity. humanity. Humanity is boundless, so everybody can have the, the space they need, and I hope that everybody learns that. Um, and maybe um, to start to answer your question. That's <laughs> difficult, I know. But <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, um, you know, the Netherlands is, uh, in our culture, it's very normal to contribute to society, to do voluntary jobs. We have a huge amount of uh, Dutch people uh, d doing voluntary work, and that gives this, this attitude gives a basis for NGOs to pop up, people putting their uh, spare time uh, uh, for a good co uh, into a good cause. Uh, we have a lot of organizations that uh, fight LGBT rights in different uh, flavors and dynamics. Um, and I think that creates an environment where uh, you vocalize a lot. Um, and one of the things I um, uh, I um, I um, one of the things that struck me when I was a, a chairperson of one of those organizations, a leading uh, a nationwide organization for transgender people, is that all these organizations put their energy uh, in the direction they want as an individual organization. And uh, the last call I'm going to make is please work together. Put your effort uh, uh, in the same direction. Um, join, uh, uh, join in on the same cause and work towards a, a better future for everybody. And for instance, I, what I really find inspiring about the situation here in Hungary is that all the opposition political parties uh, are teaming up. They formed a coalition for the next uh, election. And I think that's very brave. And I think that's very inspiring. That, <laughs> yeah. that, that uh, uh, eight, nine different political parties team up. Uh, they have the, a lot of the differences. They know that they uh, don't agree on a lot of subjects, but still they team up and try to balance the weight here in the public uh, po and politic debate. I think that's an inspiration. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Lisa. Uh, also, thank you to the other panelists, of course, Anastasia, Bart, and, uh, and uh, Anna. Um, this is not the end, of course. Now the most important part comes. I want to give the floor to the to our viewers and the people in the room here. Um, I'm just looking to, uh, for the technical people. How do we exactly work now? <laughs> um, do we work with like a microphone? With my microphone? Ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> do you want to run around? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, who wants to go first? <laughs> Don't be shy. Don't be shy, indeed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can make comments or, or, or questions, whatever you want. <laughs> We're very open, so. <laughs> yes, welcome. Um. Okay, please, so please uh, if you're feeling comfortable, also present yourself first and then... 
<laughs> um, well, um, I'm not sure. I've never spoken mm. up at a like public or kind of a political event before. Mm. Um, but hi, I'm Victoria. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and um, I would like to ask you, um, how come you're so um, interested in um, Hungarian and Polish um, LGBTQ <laughs> rights as like uh, a the, Dutch the, person? So uh, like. the, the boys, of course. Um, <laughs> no, no, joking aside. Uh, <laughs> um, it's uh, it's not particularly me. I'm not particularly interested in Hungarian or 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 or. or or Polish politics so much. It's just really, I believe that the idea, and so we are all Europeans, and if something goes wrong in one country, it's wrong, it's, it's bad for the rest of Europe as well. And yes, all the, all, over the last years, I've been working a lot on, on Poland and on Hungary. Uh, I also, when I was a student, I was living both in Budapest and Warsaw as well. So, I mean, it's a, a lot of things. It's a combination of a lot of things, and it's very complicated, why? But, but, Yes, it's just the idea if nobody is equal before we are all equal in, in Europe, but also around the world. And unfortunately, Poland and Hungary has been the two countries where there was a lot of focus on in the last year. But, but that's also something that but me, but also other activists need to change. We need to work on Europe as a, as a whole. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. My name is Simone, and I primarily volunteer with Momentum. However, I have a question for you, Lisa. Um, and I'm just wondering, how did you, well, of course, Dutch culture is different than Hungarian or Polish, Belgian, whatever it may be. But how did you mobilize your voter base to actually vote in your elections to ensure that yourself and people who are more open and ready to create change actually went out, did their part, and, well, did what they could as voters. Yeah, yeah, very good question. Uh, and also a question I was struggling with myself before I started my campaign. Um, and the big question is, should I use the fact that I'm a transgender uh, person uh, as one of my unique selling points in my campaign? Uh, at least it's, it's, uh, it's a selling point my competitors couldn't easily, easily copy, so that's... Uh, um, and in the end I decided to use it because um, it would be a shame uh, if uh, I didn't speak about it and nobody learned about it and uh, nobody got the chance to vote for uh, diversity in our Dutch parliament. And, um, so, um, and next to that, I also, um, b by telling that I'm transgender, I also send a message to the transgender community in the Netherlands. Uh, it's okay to be visible and uh, it's okay to uh, be active in our society and to uh, achieve stuff in our society because it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon that transgender people have always have a headwind. Uh, they have troubles, trouble finding a job, uh, being socially active, um, and the fact that I became a member of the Dutch Parliament, it's, it's something I also sort of uh, got because of role models that went that road before me. Um, so it, being visible as a transgender member of Parliament, or a candidate for it, that was your question, um, also gives me the opportunity to be a role model to other people and it's really weird to talk about yourself as being a role model but it's just something that I don't have to do anything about it I just have to do uh, have to be myself um, but it it's a message of hope if I can do it I'm not special so you can do it and you can do it and you can do it we can all do it as long as we believe in ourselves, stay true to who we are and what we think and what we want to achieve, and then simply uh, pinch your nose and dive in. Go for it. And the second part to the same question for everyone, I guess, is how do you think, as leaders in this, um, can we mobilize Hungarian voters who may not agree with the Fidesz government but wouldn't usually go out and vote to vote, because I know in this country, in many countries actually, voting isn't something that people prioritize or even really care about because they don't think they can in state change. 
I think that there is no one recipe for this question because it's the struggle. We are also struggling with this in Poland that many people are not voting because they don't believe into uh, that it, they can change anything, and it's, it would be miraculous if we will find the one solution for it. But what we could spot that the protest to the the, the women rights protest that occurred last year in Poland uh, was about the pride and about that the people are furious. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can acknowledge that we can be furious on politicians of what they are doing. And maybe sometimes we can use bad words against them because we are so tired of them. It happened in Poland and it mobilized thousands of people on the streets. I don't believe that we should use all the time bad words, but we can be furious. We can be furious as LGBT community uh, for what is happening against us, for what the politicians are doing against us. Maybe somehow it will be also mobilizing for the people who don't, don't believe into the that their, they, they, their voice can change anything. It's the whole system which is wrong, I think, because we was in Poland, right, that we need, we need to obey to the system, we need to be, uh, to listen to the law, we need to be always with the law, we need to be always with the, uh, t t some authorities. It's, I think, the patriarchal model is also like that. We need to listen to those males who are always uh, wanting some more, more power and, I think it's not one simple answer of how to learn people that they really matter because then the whole system will break down because then the people actually understand that we have like 39 millions in Poland people who are willing to have a change and then just maybe 300 of politicians who are in the parliament who are the minority, homophobic minority, uh, which are opposition of course. So I think that we should think about the education system maybe, but of course it cannot, we cannot change it right now. But we can at least try uh, to, to, to be the part of the change, not just to, to, to say that we want the change, but be a part of the change. And this is my call to action. Let's think what we can do, what, how we can contribute. It's not always about protests. It's not always about going to the process, but sometimes even changing the avatar on your Facebook to the rainbow colors is a symbol sometimes asking the, 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 somebody from, the, from your friends who is the LGBT, member of the LGBT community, how are you feeling? Because we see what is happening in the country. What are your feelings? Do you need help? How can I help you as being a straight member of a uh, straight ally? It's, it's the duty, I think, I've, now of the straight allies to, to ask the LGBT community of what they want, what, how we can contribute, how they can contribute. So it's the small things, but they, are really, they really matter. Yeah, if I may add a bit, because I, I'm, I, I totally agree. You know, um, it's not about, oh, I need to go uh, and be a politician and be in parliament. You can uh, contribute in, in, in a million of ways. Um, so everybody has a strength they can put forward to, to advancing the LGBT community and find, just find your strength and go for it. Yeah, no, you were looking at me many times, yeah, yeah. but I was curious about good advices as I'm in the same boat. So if I would know, we would already do it perfectly and we would be in government. No, um, <laughs> because it's a tricky situation. This is why the question came, because if you don't have platforms, we always said we don't have platform, what to do, be on the streets, there's a pandemic. Um, but I was just listening to you. Um, I, I'm not going to say anything new but just the complexity of the whole thing. I think is we always asking from politicians and from among selves what to do more, what to do differently. And of course, we have to shake the society out of political apathy. Otherwise, it's not going to change. I, I can't say it enough. It, these are not the politicians who are winning in, a, in a, an election, who are changing the government. It's the citizens. My vote equals exactly the, the unknown person next door. Mm -hmm. um, and each vote adds up. So, but we have to reach out. So every time I'm saying that uh, we, we need to empower each other because in Hungary, I think in Poland is the same. You could see the difference between cities. Cities are more liberal. Mm -hmm. People are more brave to put on a rainbow um, a pledge or, or, or um, uh, wearing uh, any kind of symbols to show the society, even to the unknown LGBTQ members that I'm with you. But we have to empower people who are living in more conservative areas, uh, more in fear, because statistics shows, because you also asked to finish 
positively this conversation. Statistic, even European also Hungarian statistics shows that acceptance is growing. The past seven years, I don't want to say uh, wrong numbers, but from around 47%, it's went up till 60 something percent the acceptance of uh, a, a gay marriage. Meanwhile, it's hateful propaganda. I haven't seen more protests. There were, the, the, the pride march is not growing that much as this number grows. And it's due to, I believe, what we also heard through Netflix and so on, the new generations watching movies, watching a lot of content where, uh, where LGBTQ community portrayed as normal families and peoples as anybody else with the same fears and problems of jealousy, break off, unemployment, and so on and so forth. This is how it can bring closer. But I'm asking everybody, it's not just coming from political communities from the other side, we have to team up. We can help. In a, if we are in a community, you can't be harmed. If you're an individual, you can't. But we can't look at you and see who you are. You have to join. Without every single person, we won't be able to change the system. And without changing the system, nothing gonna, gonna change. But I think those um, sentences helps, it's empowering. I mean, empowerment can come also other, uh, like the other side of the borders as well. Yes, thank you. Um, before we go on, I just want to say, don't hesitate to also ask your question in Hungarian. Uh, we have more than enough translators here <laughs> present, so um, so don't feel hesitant. Uh, who, who is, uh, yeah, that sir there was the first. Well, oh, okay, you already have the microphone. <laughs> go on. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm gay. My name is Zsolt Virág. I'm a CEO of the Symposium Association. It's a Hungarian NGO. LGBT, sorry, LGBT association. Um, together with the Labris Lesbian Association, we are managing the school visiting program, uh, which is uh, visited uh, high schools and uh, universities. About we are talking about our LGBT being <laughs> LGBT. This program will be denied with this new law. This is the only one program in Hungary nowadays. So I have two questions. One is, um, the first one is um, that um, why isn't here sitting uh, 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 um, people from uh, Hungarian NGOs or, or politicians who is LGBT? For example, Josef Sayer <laughs> has a scandal. We have to talk about him because the, the government is denied this this question. He is politician. He was politician. Why is not politician nowadays? Where is he? And uh, if the people say that uh, Dr. Orbán's son is gay, I don't know. It is is it true or not true? But if it's true, it's it's uh, it's a scandal too. That how can do a father with with his son this this communication this lose this this is scandal too. So I think there is there are a lot of problems which um, which are in Hungary in under the. Um, okay. Yep. And the second one is um, a sec that. Um, we are not independent from the from the circumstances. For example, pandemic situation. In Hungary in Hungary are so circumstances. So we need the circus that, uh, that for example, this LGBT law is, is is in the in the focus now. But the pandemic, why are dying a lot of people in Hungary? Worldwide, almost the most people are died in Hungary, um, percentagely in in, um, in the population, mm -hmm. or or the inflation you mentioned. Yeah, so whereby we are talking not this situation, but these problems too. Not only the Fundan University. Fundan is a very very, very important question too, but but uh, people are losing their jobs their relatives and so on so on. Why why are we allow this from the from government that not talking about these problems and um, why are we support them? 
Yeah, well, f the first question I would Thank like you. to give to Anna, uh, but coming back to your second question, I think it's very clear that, that w one of the reasons, there are many reasons, but one of the reasons why, of course, uh, Orban and his government at the moment is attacking LGBTQ people so much is because he wants to take away the attention from other things that is going wrong in, 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 in his country. He wants to take away the attention from corruption, as we were saying before, he wants to take away the, uh, the, 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 the he wants to take away the attention against uh, all the things uh, linked to, to COVID-19 and so on. So yes, th this is of course a tactic and it's very difficult of course because we have to stand up for our European values and that's, he, he, he knows that very much that we have to stand up for democracy and rule of law uh, and, and, and Hungary. Um, but, but yeah, at, um, at the same time we are playing his game. So really, we, I mean, maybe I should ask the qu an, an additional question to that. How do we break the game? How do we break in, in his game? I think that's a very... Everybody's looking at me. <laughs> well, I have to say... No, no, actually, not particularly, sorry. Yeah, but, yeah. You know. um, I think it's a very difficult question um, because everybody is trying to um, determine the game that's, that, 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 is, that is to be played. Um, I think there's really a lot of um, power in numbers. So we've discussed it before, teaming up, becoming a big movement, becoming a broad coalition really helps to set, uh, to set the game, to set the agenda and to determine what, uh, what the topics are. Uh, and I think that's the only way to balance the, the, the formal and informal power of uh, the, the urban uh, uh, government. We are too much reactionary, I think, sometimes. Yeah. We are always on the defensive. Uh, we need to be the agenda setter again. Oh, but on the other hand, I don't believe that, uh, I mean, the human beings, people, when ta somebody is abusing their rights or even telling that somebody wants to abuse their rights, like the proposition uh, in the Polish government to have such a, the same anti-LGBT law, of course, my reaction is harsh. I don't want them to abuse my rights. And of course, I know that they are playing the game where they want to raise some emotions to close eyes on other things, but this is the politics. And as a activists, as human being, I can have those emotions and we need to allow the people to have those emotions against the politicians and to have, to, to, to have this peaceful protest and on the other hand I think that there is no solution in this question because we will always react when somebody is abusing our rights. Yeah, but the thing is that if you, uh, if you react only on, uh, on this uh, threat on LGBT rights, then you're feeding the, di the diversion tactics of the, uh, of the government. So the, uh, my attempt would be to uh, focus on the broader issue of human rights being at stake with dynamics like this. So it's not an LGBT issue. This is not an LGBT issue, but it's a human rights issue. And at this po point in time, it's the LGBT community being targeted with th this horrible law. Uh, like I said earlier, tomorrow it can be uh, women, uh, the day after tomorrow, it can be a religious freedom that's, uh, that is at stake. So we should uh, find allies in those groups. It's about humanity and being free as a human person. And that's, that's the way to go, I think. Anna, how, how do you see that? Because, of course, you know Orban's games the best here. So. <laughs> I'm not sure if I know, but for sure I feel it on a daily yes, basis, yes. Uh, the consequences of his mm -hmm. uh, hateful strategy. Um, I don't want to not answer to the question, but I, I, I honestly believe that there are waves in political movements or political directions, and I think populism or the faces, and populism is a face. This is a populist tactic, to, as we already mentioned before in other questions. I think at one point people are going to be fed up and it's going to turn somewhere else and then there's going to be the political trend and party is going to use that. Um, the thing is the easiest would be if somehow we could have an open conversation with the people um, and agree on that just because I'm not going to react on, that, uh, um, um, on, on, on the newest shameful law, it doesn't mean that value-based I'm now with you. But you can't do that because you have to assure your voters that those values you claim to believe to, 
uh, uh, those promises you were campaigning in order to convince them to listen to you is there even if you are not making a photo with a rainbow flag. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, because they receive so much hatred, you can't afford not putting out signals and symbols. Mm -hmm. But the moment you do that, they won. Yeah. Um, this is why we have to use all the opportunities to talk about all those dis issues that you were um, uh, mentioned, not just the Fudan. I just give an example because it's an international panel. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, if we could start talking about um, 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 all the shameful moves and all the corruption cases by the Hungarian government, uh, we wouldn't be able to talk about any LGBTQ rights tonight. Um, and those are, again, things we have to face and we have to fight. Um, and right away answer to the first question. Two years ago, I mean, unfortunately last yes, year, there were no um, uh, pride uh, events uh, because of the pandemic. Two years ago, Momentum also organized an event and that was a, a roundtable discussion only with Hungarian openly gay uh, politicians. That was really important to, to talk openly. Um, this year, they decided to organize an international uh, run table focusing on exactly these similar patterns coming from Russia, from love, yes. arrive to Hungary and who knows where it ends. And I think it's really important to talk about these things as well, because as we talked, what happened in one country can happen in the other. We have to learn from each other, we have to share practices and also experiences and information, because we cannot know who's going to be the next and how. Yes, yeah. and I mean that's a question I want to I want to ask to Anastasia as well because I think it's also that that was also one of the main ways why Vladimir Putin already from 2011 the, 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 and I remember the 2010 2011 election campaign when there were also a lot of protests and 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 and, and Russia and the Russian uh, protesters were like having this white ribbon and I remember Vladimir Putin back then saying oh yeah this HIV LGBT activists are taking the streets so that's that was basically also the the, the, the start of his anti LGBTI com campaign do you feel that this was also a, a way and Russia already to divert the attention from, uh, from, uh, fr from other problems at the moment? I think uh, when you base your rhetoric, when you base your agenda um, uh, and when you try to unite uh, people, unite your constituency based on hate because there is this Im imaginary enemy, um, it, unfortunately it can be very beneficial in terms of the political points that uh, that he gets so um, probably you are correct I never thought about it uh, from this angle but um, I think it might be the case yes uh, I, I I also wanted to agree with uh, what Lisa said about um, um, the fact it's not just LGBTQ rights um, I keep saying that Basically, every society consists of uh, people of multiple minorities. Uh, uh, almost everybody is a minority in a certain way, health-based or age-based or ethnicity-based or religious uh, beliefs-based. Uh, um, and so on and so forth. So every society consists of many, many, many different uh, minorities. And uh, uh, basically, you never know who would be attacked uh, next. Uh, uh, in Russia, it comes to an extreme where people get attacked solely based on their appearance. Uh, when uh, there was a case a few weeks ago, a teenager in St. Petersburg, we don't even know if he was a part of LGBTQ community. Honestly, probably no. But uh, he had um, ear piercing and he was brutally attacked in the center of the city and was very, very injured because of homophobia. So it comes to that extremes. And then there are a lot of people who might look a little bit unconventional, just, you know, tall uh, woman who uh, has certain masculine features. She may or may not be a part of LGBTQ community. Still in Russia, she uh, can be attacked uh, solely based on her appearance. So it is very scary. And I think we need to, uh, in every country, we need to explain, um, explain to people that, uh, it's not just about this particularly uh, particular minority. Uh, it also can affect you or your relatives or literally anybody. Yes, there was another question. 
Attila vagyok Budapestről, én hagyományos családban élek, normális családban, és két fiam van. Itt a Donát képviselő asszony többször is említette a, a gyűlölet szót háromszor is, ha jól emlékszem, elmondta, hogy a magyar társadalomban, vagy a magyar kormányban olyan gyűlölet van az LMBT közösségekkel szemben, ami szerintem megengedhetetlen. De nem erről van szó, arról van szó, hogy a hagyományos családjainkkal szeretnék az a magyar emberek többsége megvédeni. Az ellen az erőszakos LMBTQ nyomulással szemben, amelyeket ön képvisel itt külföldi elvtársaival együtt. Ezt mindenképpen szeretném hozzátenni, hogy nem a kormány embere. Igen? Kormány. Szeretném. Ennyit, ennyit, ennyit a demokráciáról szeretném, hogyha el, el tudnám mondani. A... De ne, de... Eddig, eddig meghallgattam önöket, tehát ne vicceljünk. Ez önöknek a demokrácia? What? They just wanted to protect Hungarian families for the LGBT group propagandists like myself and all of you. What? I didn't get it. Engedjük, engedjük meg az úrnak, hogy befejezze a mondatot. Én pont arra kérem a többieket, hogy ezt az egy mondatban kérem fejezze be, meghallgatom, hogy mi a véleménye. Semmi gond. Igen, ezt, szeretné, ezt szeretnénk elmondani, illetve megkérdezni azt, hogy miért gondolja úgy, hogyha valaki a hagyományos családjait védi azon országok, akár Lengyelország, akár Magyarország, hogy akkor az gyűlölettel van az LMBTQ közösségekkel szemben, pedig csak a hagyományos családjainkat védjük. Ugye? Mr. But nobody is interested if what, of what you are want to say. There is a, an exit, so we can go. Az, az, az rendben van, hogyha angolul válaszolok, hogy értsék, és a... rendben. Van. Meghallgattam önöket, én a Nemzeti Konzervatív Mi Hazánk Mozgalom Budapesti elnöke vagyok, és úgy érezzük, hogy döntő szerepet játszottunk abban, hogy a kormány meghozta ezt. Uh, okay. Miért? Miért? Ez, ez, But, uh, ez problémát uh, okoz önöknek? Uh, sir, want to say sir, something to us? You can change into sir, English. You had your Vá- válaszolok a kérdésére, hogyha sir, engedi. Sir, you had your minutes. You can leave the building now. Igen, én azt mondom, erre a kérdésére válaszolok, mert ez nem volt homofób, de szeretném kérni, hogy engedje meg. Erre nyugodt, erre tényleg válaszolok erre a kérdésére. I'm going to answer in English because he has a translator and the, the first question was, uh, was uh, I believe, was not a homophobic question, was actually a really valid question because his question was why, um, why we are propagate LMBTQ rights and issues, me and all of you and the international community. Uh, meanwhile, um, there are just normal, normal people, basic people who just want to have traditional lifestyle and why we want to pushing our views on them. And the answer is that nobody is pushing their views on you or your families. I think, actually, um, not just think, I know rainbow families, uh, let, engedje meg, hogy válaszik. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to answer if you, if you, if you let me answer, otherwise I'm really, that's, uh, I'm really open for debate. I'm really open for conversation and I think you have a valid question, but I think uh, you ask it because you're interested in my answer. Otherwise, I don't think it's really a discussion. So the answer is to your question is that all the rainbow families, all the gay families and transgender families, because I even know those I met, they actually want nothing more but a traditional family lifestyle to let them live in traditional ways to marry, to raise their kid, to go to work, in return to paying taxes just as much as us, many times even more than average Hungarians. Uh, they, they're paying their taxes, they're following the rule, they respect democratic settings and the only thing they want not to get beaten, not to get hated and let them to just live. Nobody is propagate that lifestyle because this is not a lifestyle. These are people who, this is how they find their happiness. And I believe as before in this conversation, it was already named. To give somebody the same right of happiness and traditional lifestyles, it won't take anything away from you. You don't have to like rainbow families. You don't have to like guys kissing. You don't have to see it. But 
you, please, you and your party, you, you have no right to tell people how they must live just because you think that that's the happy life. Because they're also not coming to your bedroom and looking what you are doing and criticizing. Everybody's private life is their own business. They're just asking to have a peaceful, happy life, a traditional life, getting married, having children, going to work, going on vocation, they have exactly the same needs as us, and they cannot have more traditional conservative wishes than you. So everybody wants the same, why not to protect all families, and why not be talking about real issues, why people doesn't have money to go on vocation, why kids are uh, facing violence within families, because those are the issues you are afraid of, not rainbow families. I would, continue. I would also, uh, let's, let's, yeah, continue. let's continue. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so hi, I'm Petra. I'm a first year student at King's College London, but I'm also Hungarian. So oh, yeah. So firstly, I would like to just like make a comment and some questions. Um, firstly, I would like to ask people to like read a bit more about history because people traditionally lived in LGBTQ families throughout history from like the ancient times. So it's good to have some books about it maybe. And then I would have a question um, concerning political participation and the election. So what do you think? the EU can do on an institutional level to kind of promote citizen participation, not just for elections, but during, like between elections. So like in general, political participation and engage citizens more in this political area and policy making. Thank you. Uh, I feel like I yeah. talked already a lot. So yeah. that's why I want to give the floor of you if you want to answer. I just, I mean, I think it's important that the EU facilitates, and the word facilitating is a very important word. Uh, we, need to, we need to facilitate local activists. We need to facilitate grassroots initiatives. It's the change only can come from, from, from bottom up, basically. Uh, so what the EU should do is making more funds available to civil society. But because it's the civil society and the member states uh, that are really doing a good job. And I wanted to give one example. It's an example that, that my organization, we funded the, this project in Poland. It's, it's, it's called the Mapa of Nochi, the, the, the equality map. It's basically an LGBT-friendly school ranking um, and, and a ranking where all students in, a high, in, high, in, in secondary schools in, uh, in, in, uh, in Poland were invited to basically rank their school on LGBTIQ inclusive. It's, it's, it opens the debate in schools on how to, to, how, to, how to treat LGBTIQ people and students better because, of course, a lot of these teenagers are really, really um, yeah, threatened and, and are really, really feeling bad by the homophobic that rhetoric that, that, we, that, we, that we see, not only coming from politics but around them, from their own parents and so on. So they need to have this loving environment. They need to, sh you know, they need to be a debate about LGBTQ rights also at schools. And we saw immediately when, when, when the project was launched by the Polish organization that so many queer kids uh, were actually filling in the surveys uh, about it, like 30,000 uh, now uh, uh, queer kids actually participated in this. So we need to, 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 to support this kind of projects, projects on the ground, projects in schools and where, where, where kids are, uh, are, are working with. Because it's, 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 yeah, it, it must be really bad to hear as you are young and growing up and discovering your sexuality and gender identity to hear this homophobic, transphobic rhetoric all the time. And we really need to change that narrative. And I have a good news for that because we're not just fought for keeping funding for that, but we double this amount for the next seven years uh, um, uh, um, um, of the, the budget of the European Union. It's called Citizenship Equality Rights and Values Program. 1.6 billion euros going to go to these courses, uh, mostly go civil society organization or projects, fighting with human rights, democracy, um, 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 there is a Daphne's trans, which is about women's rights, including LGBTQ rights, all these projects which are about to keep promoting and involving citizens 
in democratization, critical thinking, how to protect each other, how to raise awareness, and because normally that's always the answer, we would want to do a lot of things, but there's no money. The good news, there is 1.6 billion euro for the upcoming seven years all over Europe. Yes, uh, I just wanted to add to, to that, that the European Commission should make it a bit more accessible to, to, do, to actually do the application procedure. But indeed, we're working on that. <laughs> Um, and one of you maybe want to add something? Is there any? Mirror? Okay. Um, if there is no more question, uh, we can uh, round. Oh, is there one? Is it? Yeah, for, yeah. Let's do one more. It's <laughs> not a question, but uh, uh, I need a, so I I say it in Hungarian because. Szeretném, hogyha mi hazánk mozgalomnak a vezetője pontosan érteni azt, amit mondok, magyarul fogom neki mondani, hogy teljesen pontosan eljusson, tehát nem nem lesz fordítás hozzá. Én 14 éve élek együtt a, most már a férjemmel. Én azt gondolom, hogy az a 14 éves együttélés, amit mi végigcsináltunk, az teljesen normális. Egy valamit kérek szépen a Fidesztől, meg a Mi Hazánk mozgalomról, aki a zsebéből lók ki a Fidesznek, hogy mind a összes barátjukat fogják meg, másztanak fel a kedvenc RS csatornájukra, és takarodjanak ki a hálószobánkból. Nagyon szépen köszönöm. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for this comment. I think it's a good end of the of the evening. Uh, um, I just want to thank everybody, everybody in this room. I, I wish a lot of love to everybody in this room here tonight. Um, and there are just two words I want to end with, and that's just happy prides. <laughs>